Let's uh, stand and pray real quick. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art ever present and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come dwell in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, a good one. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen. Well, good evening to everyone. Welcome back to the second class in our series, This Desert, a City, where we're surveying the lives and sayings of seven desert ascetics taken from the sayings of the Desert Fathers by Benedicta Ward. This is the, called the Alphabetical Collection, and like I said last week, it goes according to the Greek alphabet, not the English alphabet. So things will be out of order if you're expecting the English alphabet. Last week we uh, looked at St. Anthony the Great, that uh, father of monasticism, um, the kind of founder of the ascetic you know, life in community. <clears throat> and this week we're moving on to a different great, St. Sisois the Great. St. Sisois lived at the same time and uh, lived after Anthony reposed, um, but he lived, he was a contemporary of St. Anthony. And so, like, I want to, I said last week, and I want to um, kind of remind you that um, in these uh, classes, I'm trying to, as much as possible, allow the saints to speak for themselves, allow the church to speak and tell us about the saints as much as possible and not, um, you know, put my commentary in their lives or their sayings too much, um, at least not more than necessary. Because my goal is to actually, you know, meet these saints, who they are, um, and through these short seven weeks, hopefully, uh, you know, give you a little uh, thirst, what's your appetite to kind of get to, more, get to know some more of them. Um, and I also want you to remember that, you know, we're going to, we, like we did last week and like we will this week and every week to come, we're going to hear um, about uh, some amazing kind of lives, and we're going to hear some sometimes very difficult sayings, um, and I want you to remember that we're not called to mimic the saints, any saints, in everything they did. However, we are called to mimic their spirit, the way which, in which they approach the spiritual life, you know, their fortitude, their patience, their love. You know, we're not called to be like St. Anthony, St. Sisuis. We're called to be who we are, you know, living in our own time, but called to live in the same spirit that they live. So don't, uh, you know, be downtrodden if we can't live up to their standards, because we most definitely can't. And with that, I want to... Uh, like last week, open with reading the Synaxarian reading for St. Sisuis. Synaxarian, remember, is the collection of the lives of the saints and how we celebrate them every day. So on the 6th of July, we celebrate the memory of our venerable father, Sisuis the Great. Having taken up the Lord's cross in his youth, our blessed father Sisuis retired to the desert of Scytis. 
He made such rapid progress in virtue and ascetic striving that he was soon considered by all as a model of what a monk should be. Shortly after the death of St. Anthony, when the deserts of Scytis and Nitria began to be overpopulated, Sisuis decided to go with his disciple Abraham to the inner mountain where the great patriarch of the desert had lived and which at that time had been abandoned because of barbarian invasions in about the year 357. He remained there for 72 years, making St. Anthony's life his model in everything. One day, a brother asked him if he had attained the stature of Abba Anthony. He replied, if I had one of Abba Anthony's thoughts, I should become all aflame. But I do know a man who with difficulty is able to bear Anthony's thoughts. From time to time, he received provisions from a monk who would come from Pispir, but sometimes it happened that the latter would delay for almost 10 months. While he was walking in the mountains, Sisuis met a hunter who had traveled from Farin, that is Sinai, and who had not seen another human being for 11 months. The elder returned to his cell, beating his breast and saying, you thought you had done something special, but you have not even equaled this layman. Among the virtues that adorned his soul was that of humility, and it shone the brightest. He told his visitors that it was acquired firstly through abstinence, then through prayer, and lastly by struggling to consider oneself inferior to everyone in everything. He so loved fasting and was so absorbed in prayer that he remained for whole days without the least concern about food. And when his disciple Abraham spoke to him about this, he replied in all simplicity, Have we not eaten, my child? When Abraham said that they had not, Siswis said, If we have not eaten, bring the food and we will eat. It happened that the son of a man who had journeyed to visit the elder on the mountain died on the way. His father was not at all troubled, but simply carried him trustfully to the elder and bowed down before Sisuis with the son. He then left Sisuis with the child. The elder, thinking that the latter remained prostrate through respect, said to him, Get up and go outside. Immediately the dead child stood up and went out. Stopping one day before the tomb of Alexander the Great, the elder contemplated with tears the vanity of earthly glory and began to weep over the common lot of humanity. He then returned to his cell to await there the coming of the Lord. To one of the brothers who had fallen into, several sin, fallen into sin several times, he said, Get up again and again. The brother asked, How many times? Until you are taken either up in virtue or in sin, for a man presents himself to judgment in a state in which he is found. When St. Sisuis had finished his course and was at the point of death, while the brethren were seated around him, his face suddenly began to shine like the sun. He said to them, Look, Abba, An Look, Abba Anthony is coming. And a little later, Look, the choir of the prophets is approaching. His face shone all the more, and he said, Look, the choir of the apostles is coming. His face radiant, he seemed to be speaking with an invisible being. He replied to the father's question as to the identity of his interlocutor. The angels are coming to fetch me, and I am begging them to let me have a little time for repentance. The elders said to him, You have no need for repentance, Father. Sisuis then replied, weeping, Truly, I do not think that I have even yet made a beginning. The fathers praised such great humility and understood that he had reached perfection. His face suddenly became more radiant than the sun, and they were all filled with fear. The elder murmured, Look, the Lord is coming, and he sang, Bring me the vessel from the desert. At these words, St. Sisuis gave his soul into God's hands. There was a flash of darting lightning, and the whole place was filled with a sweet fragrance. Talk about a truly blessed death. He, as we heard, tried to emulate as much as possible the life of St. Anthony, even living in St. Anthony's inner mountain, as it said, for 72 years. And he uh, received the reward for his labors at the end of his life. 
You hear how many people came to see him? First St. Anthony came, and then the prophets, then the apostles, the angels, then the Lord himself. This is a life pleasing to God, but it's not an easy life. So with that, let's dig into the sayings. In this collection, we have 54 recorded sayings. And I've uh, picked out 21 tonight since his life was a little bit shorter. His life was a little bit shorter, so we can, you know, deal with a few more <coughs> sayings. And so let's start with number one. He said, A brother whom another brother had wronged came to see Abba Sisuis. And said to him, My brother has hurt me, and I want to avenge myself. The old man pleaded with him, saying, No, my child, leave vengeance to God. He said to him, I shall not rest until I have avenged myself. The old man said, Brother, let us pray. Then the old man stood up and said, God, we no longer need you to care for us, since we do justice for ourselves. Hearing these words, the brothers fell at the old man's feet, saying, I will no longer seek justice for my brother. Forgive me, Abba. And then we have this short snippet from uh, his life and what, how he responded to this monk who wanted to you know, take vengeance into his own hand. And it was such a practical teaching of uh, St. Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 6, 7, where he says, Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept the wrong why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? For those who want to be perfect, to excel in the spiritual life, is these kinds of practices that really give you a boost. Allowing yourselves to be wrong. Not always trying to defend yourself and justify yourself, but, you know, taking a little abuse. You know, letting someone cut you off and praying for them, you know. And, you know, saying it's okay. You know, we don't... That's the way that he approached that. Instead of, like, busting in and like, saying let's pray and saying, okay, God, you know, we got this. Mm -hmm. We don't need you. And it taught them a lesson. Yeah, I mean, and that's what you see in so many of these sayings is they know exactly what to do to just get to the heart of the matter, you know, what to say, what to do. You know, they become so enlightened and they know, um, you know, number one, they understand how the spirit moves because they're so attuned with the spirit, but they also know people. You know, through their enlightenment, they know people, you know, whether um, the Spirit helps them to understand or, you know, just their experience in dealing with people. They know exactly what to do, what to say to get the point across, you know. It's, it's, constant, it's a constant uh, theme, you know, throughout all the sayings. The next thing I want is uh, saying four. And we heard this in the, uh, in the reading from his life. I'm going to highlight it again. Abba Sisuis, his disciple, often said to him, Abba, get up and let us eat. And he would say to him, have we not eaten, my child? He would reply, no, father. The old, then the old man would say, if we have not eaten, bring the food and we will eat. And I wanted to highlight this because it's such an example of how detached he was from earthly things, even necessary earthly things like eating. You know, there's nothing wrong with eating, you know, drinking, you know. There's things that we have to do to stay alive. Um, they're neither good nor bad. It's how we use them. But he was so far advanced, so detached from earth that he did, wouldn't even realize that he hadn't eaten. You know, it wasn't a thing for him. You know, he was sustained by uh, a much uh, deeper, um, much more... Uh, nourishing 
uh, food, which is, you know, the Lord himself. And we have saying five. Abbasiso expressed himself freely one day, saying, Have confidence. For thirty years I have not prayed to God about my faults, but I have made this prayer to him. Lord Jesus, save me from my tongue, and until now every day I fall because of it and commit sin. So once again, there's probably a saying in each one of these, because there are fathers and mothers in here, about what we say, you know, the importance of the tongue, of how it can be our rising or our falling, you know, our exaltation or our destruction. Saying six. A brother said to Abbasisuis, How is it that the passions do not leave me? The old man said, Their tools are inside you. Give them their pay and they will go away. So I actually don't have anything to say about this because I still haven't figured out what it means. (laughs) But I'm working. I want to work on trying to figure out what this means. What it means uh, giving them their pay. Um... So hopefully I can report back to you and maybe in a few weeks. But um, I just thought it was a very interesting uh, you know, saying and uh, maybe you can remind me to try to figure it out so I don't forget. The next one we have is saying 10. One of the inhabitants of the Thibet came to see Abba Sisuis one day because he wanted to become a monk. The old man asked him if he had any relations in the world. He replied, I have a son. The old man said, go and throw him into the river, and then you will become a monk. As he went to throw him in, the old man sent a brother in haste to prevent him. The brother said, stop what you are doing. But the other said to him, the Abba told me to throw him in. So the brother said, but afterwards he said, do not throw him in. So he left his son and went to find the old man, and he became a monk, tested by obedience. So this is one of those hard sayings. You know, it's... Not uh, too different from the um, the life of Abraham and the sacrifice of Isaac. And we see a great obedience to the word, you know, in this case of the saint, um, in Abraham's case of God himself. You know, this is, uh, you know, this is number one. It's not normal. Typically, we don't leave people, you know, that need our care. You know, this is one of those case-by-case basis, basis where we can say that, that the saint had, you know, some kind of enlightenment to do this. Um, but it also shows us, you know, how important obedience is. You know, it's the cornerstone virtue of any progress that we might make. You know, for the monk or the nun, that obedience is given to their abbot or abbess, you know, their elder. For us in the world, that obedience is mainly given to um, Christ, you know, following his commandments in the scriptures. Um, and then in certain cases to, you know, the priest or a bishop. But we don't have the same, um, we're not called to the same level of obedience to our priest or to the bishop that a monk or a nun has to their elder. Um, but without obedience, you know, we, uh, we're not going to make any progress in anything. Next is saying 11. A brother asked Abba Sisuis, Did Satan pursue them like this in the early days? The old man said to him, He does this more at the present time, because his time is nearly finished and he is enraged. You know, I thought this was an important saying, you know, especially for these times of great uncertainty that we live in now. And we don't know what's going to happen, you know, in the next day or the next week. Just everything is uh, so topsy-turvy. And it... Uh, it's a good reminder he gives us that, you know, we see all this evil happening in the world. Um, we know that Satan is on the prowl, like uh, the scriptures tell us, like a roaring lion, roaring, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. 
And uh, it's a good reminder. It's not because of any power that he has, but it's because he's a weak, you know. He's uh, scared. Christ has conquered him, and he's like a child acting out, trying to throw a big fit and ruin everything. Um, but we see all this stuff going on in the world, and we should, you know, take heart. You know, it's not a sign of, you know, the, the power, powerlessness of God or, you know, the great power of Satan, but rather it's, you know, the, it's a sign of his weakness that he's, you know, he's not, he, he hasn't given up yet, even though he's been conquered, and he's just throwing a big fit. I had saying 14 listed to read, but it was the account of his passing um, that we just read in his life. So I'll skip that, but, you know, it's just amazing to see his humility. You know, it wasn't feigned humility. You know, sometimes we're, we're you know, we think uh, we can pretend to be humble and we're actually humble. But, you know, in the lives of these saints, they're actually humble. He actually thought he had not made a beginning yet to his repentance. And he still needed time to do it. Um, and it's something to strive for. One of those ways we can do it is, like saying one, you know, accept a little abuse. Saying 15. Abba Adelphius, bishop of Neolopolis, went to find Abba Sisuis on the mountain of Abba Anthony. When they were ready to leave before setting out on their road, Abba Sisuis made them eat before morning. Now it was a fast day, and as he was setting the table, behold, some brothers came and knocked on the door. He said to his disciple, Give them a little to eat, for they are tired. Abba Adelphius said to him, No, don't do that, in case they say that Abba Sisuis eats before morning. So the old man thought about it, and then he said to the brother, Go on, give them something. Now when they saw the food, they said, Have you visitors, and is that why the old man is eating with you? The brother replied, It was so. They were, then they were very distressed, and they said, May God forgive you, because you have let the old man eat now. Do you not know that because of this he will mortify himself for a long time? Hearing this, the bishop did penance before the old man, saying, Forgive me, Abba, for I reasoned on a human level while you do the work of God. Abba Sisui said to him, If God does not glorify a man, the glory of men is without value. So we see in this saying, this snippet is that this bishop has visited Abba Sisui and they're going to eat. They, the bishop is about to set back on his journey to go back to his place. And they want to eat a little something so they have some strength for the journey. But it's morning. And if you know anything about um, you know, monastic fasting, uh, in these, uh, these stories and in kind of the history of the church, most of these ascetics wouldn't have their first meal, if you could call what they ate with a meal, until, you know, after Vespers in the evening. So it was a big deal to see him eat in the morning, to see Abbasisuas eat in the morning. And because of this, you see, they kind of chastised the bishop because now because he ate in the morning, he was going to fast even more. And so, um, you know, he would break his fast out of love for his brother, but then he would fast even more out of love for God. You know, because he, he didn't want to lose that grace from his fasting, so he uh, would, it said, mortify himself even more. Um, it's a good kind of... Uh, Thank the practice if you can. If you have to break the fast for whatever reason, try to fast, you know, a little bit more the next day. Or the fast for those meals that you broke beforehand. You know, kind of don't just break the fast and then, you know, say, okay, that's it. And move on. You know, we'll get it another day. 
saying 17. <laughs> Abba Amun of Rethu asked Abba Sisuis, when I read the scriptures, my mind is wholly concentrated on the words so that I may have something to say if I'm asked. The old man said to him, that is not necessary. It is better to enrich yourself through purity of spirit and to be without anxiety and then to speak. I thought this was really interesting because, I mean, to be able to say something, to be able to, you know, help someone, you know, obviously to know the scriptures would be a good thing. But, but Abba Siswes is saying that it's better to be pure. It's better to, you know, have a little holiness and then to speak. Um, because I think maybe then you know it from experience, you know, you know the struggle, you know how to live the life, and it's not just words that you can know, you know, that you can repeat or whatever. I'll skip that one because we heard about it in his life. That was about when he raised the uh, man's son from the dead on accident. And my only, only comment with, for that one was, whoops. Um, So saying 21, when Abba Sisuis went from Klisma one day, some seculars came to see him. That is, those who uh, were from the city, they weren't, weren't monks. Though they talked a great deal, he did not answer them by so much as a word. Later, one of them said, why do you bother the old man? He does not eat. That is why he cannot speak. The old man replied, for my part, I eat when the need arises. So he's not talking about eating, he's talking about talking, he's talking about speaking, because they've been talking all day long, and he hadn't said a word. And so when they said he doesn't eat, that's why he can't speak, he says, I eat when I need to. But he's really talking about speaking, I only talk when I need to. And he didn't need to that day until that point. <laughs> Saying 22. Abba Joseph asked Abba Sisuis, For how long must a man cut away the passions? The old man said to him, Do you want to know how long? Abba Joseph answered, Yes. The old man said to him, So long as a passion attacks you, cut it away at once. So he's asking how to, uh, you know, how long he's going to take to get over to certain sins, whatever sins afflict us. And, uh, you know, his answer is, uh, he doesn't give an answer, but he tells you that when it does attack you, as long as it attacks you, get rid of it at once. You know, stop the thought. Stop the action immediately. And if we can do that, you know, we can slowly rid ourselves of these things. The problem is that most of the time, we don't cut it off at once. We, uh, like to play around with the whatever, you know, whether the thought be, you know, like a cat with a ball of yarn and knock it around in our minds or whatever it is, you know. Saying 24. It was said of Abba Sisuis that when he was sitting in the cell, he would always close the door. And this showed me, if I'm correct, my thinking that... He wanted no distractions. You think about if you leave your door open at home, you leave your door open, you know, in the office, if you have an office or something. You know, people walk by, say, hello, how's it going, you know, this or that. Or even just seeing people, you know, you're working or you're doing whatever and then you look up because, you know, you see something go across the doorway. You know, but, you know, Abba Sisbis, he closed his door. He didn't want to be distracted. He wanted to do the work at hand, which was prayer, and, uh, you know, obtaining the virtues. Saying 25. One day some Arians came to see Abba Sisuis on Abba Anthony's mountain, and they began to speak against the Orthodox faith. The old man gave them no answer, but he called his disciple and said to him, Abraham, bring me the book of St. Athanasius and read it. Then they were silent as their heresy was unmasked, and he sent them away in peace. 
You know, this is something we saw last week in St. Anthony, um, life and sayings, and now we're seeing it this week, and I'm sure we'll um, come across it in the, few, in the weeks to come. <clears throat> but these saints, they have no time for heresy. You know, they have no time to, you know, discuss it, play with it, you know, argue about it. They only, number one, they, as we heard, he was tired of listening to it. And so he knew what would put them to shame was, you know, what he's talking about is on the incarnation, you know. He's talking about all the writings of St. Athanasius. So, who spoke against the Arians. And so, you know, they, they didn't have time for all the false nonsense and we shouldn't either. You know, we should be loving towards people. He says he sent them away in peace. You know, he had no uh, you know hard feelings or anything, ill will towards them. But he wasn't going to, you know, be in the presence of people spouting nonsense all the time. And, uh, you know, the, these saints are very serious that the truth of the faith is um, upheld and not watered down or falsified. So saying 29, he also said, when there is someone who takes care of you, you are not to give him orders. So uh, he's talking about like a cell attendant, like his, his disciple, we've uh, heard a couple of times, Abraham, you know, someone like that. You know, they're already sacrificing for you. Why are you giving them orders? Too. You know, why are you ordering them around? I mean, they're already willing to do it. Why are you, you know, making uh, it harder for them? But when I read this, you know, I couldn't help but think of marriage, you know? And hopefully, uh, you know, each spouse is taking care of the other, you know, in their own ways. And we should realize that. We should realize the sacrifice that it uh, that takes, you know. Not we don't want doesn't we don't we don't we don't always want to be taking care of another person, <laughs> you know. Sometimes we like to, uh, you know, want to, you know, do whatever we want to do. <laughs> but um, and you know, vice versa, they don't want to always you know do something for us, like doing the laundry or whatever, or uh, you know, cutting the grass. You know, what are all, this, all these things? They're not always the most pleasant things, but we should realize that, you know, that we care for each other um, out of love for each other. We're already sacrificing enough, and we don't need to, as much as we can, try to order each other around, you know. Let's not be uh, tyrants in our houses, either husbands or wives. <clears throat> Saying 33, one of the fathers related to Abbasisuis of Kalamon that what wishing to overcome sleep one day, he hung himself over the precipice of Petra. An angel came to take him down and ordered him not to do that again and not to transmit such teachings to others. Do you understand what he's saying? So he's basically tied himself over a cliff. So he's trying to overcome, you know, the natural bodily impulses of sleep. You know, he's trying to keep vigil, but he's doing it in a very poor way. So an angel had to come and correct him. Um, I just thought that was a you know pretty uh, funny story, in it in in the creativity of these ascetics, of how they might try to uh, help themselves overcome uh, you know some of the even natural. Uh, you could call it a, a natural uh, passion in a way, you know, something that's neutral, sleep. We all need it, but um, he was trying to lessen his need of it in a poor way, so an angel had to come correct him. Where are we at? Saying 34. One of the fathers asked Abbasisuis, if I'm sitting in the desert and a barbarian comes to kill me, and if I'm stronger than he, shall I kill him? The old man said to him, 
No, leave him to God. In fact, whatever the trial is which comes to a man, let him say, This has happened to me because of my sins. And if something good comes, say, It is through the providence of God. So, uh, you know, Will and I were actually talking about something similar um, with this earlier, you know, turning the other cheek, you know, what's the extent, um, and kind of at least where we uh, started to gain some framework of how to understand these things is through um, some teaching from St. Cyril, St. Cyril, St. Methodius' brother, the Enlighteners of the Slavs. And he discussed that, um, you know, the Lord says, obviously, to love your enemy and pray for them, do good to them, you know, turn the other cheek. But he also says that no man hath a greater love than this, than he lay down his life for his friend. And so St. Cyril interprets this, that when we are personally hurt, personally insulted, personally, you know, whatever, is that is when we turn the other cheek. That's when we accept the abuse, you know, whatever it comes. But when, you know, St. Cyril is using um, the example of a nation, you know, going to war or defending itself in war against another nation. But I think it can be kind of scaled down, even to like a family unit or something like this. Um, when it's a group of people, it would be unloving to allow someone else to suffer because of you know, the violence or something of someone else. But, uh, you know, we see in um, this saying <clears throat> about um, the intensity of the spiritual life, how far these saints are willing to go, that he even say, be killed. You know, <laughs> do the ultimate cheek turn. <laughs> um, to uh, really... Uh, fulfill the command of Christ. But he also says that if something good happens, you know, say it's not your fault, basically. Or you're going to say it's not because of you. So that's, you know, on the one hand, we're taking blame because of our sins. And on the other hand, we're not, uh, you know, trying to get the glory. We're not trying to get the praise because something good happened. You know, this is the way of humility. So thing 38. And we heard this a little bit in the life. And I want to go over it again. <clears throat> a brother asked Abba Sisuis, What shall I do, Abba, for I have fallen? And the old man said to him, Get up again. The brother said, I have got up again, but I have fallen again. The old man said, Get up again and again. So then the brother asked, How many times? The old man said, Until you are taken up either in virtue or in sin. For a man presents himself to judgment in the state in which he was found. You know, this is extremely important um, that we continue to repent. Sometimes it feels like we just can't get over a sin. We just keep doing the same thing over and over again. You know, we keep coming to the confession with the same list, basically. I mean, we could not even make a change and be the same thing from the last time. Um, and that's okay. What we need to do, though, is to keep coming back. Keep realizing those things that we keep falling into them and keep confessing them. Keep getting up in this language. You know, when we sin, it's as if we trip, we fall down, you know. We scrape our knees, we bang ourselves up. But the important thing is that we get back up. Like you said, we either go to judgment, either having fallen down or having gotten back up. So when the Lord you know, calls us to himself, will he have found us continually getting back up or will he have found us, you know, rolling around on the ground and never hadn't gotten up or, you know, kind of given up on getting up? Um, really important. You know, at least we can come to confession and keep confessing it. We can be sorrowful that we can't, you know, overcome our sins. Saying 46. One day, Abba Abraham, Abba Sisuis' disciple, went away on an errand. 
During his absence, the old man did not wish to be served by anyone else. Shall I let any other man except my brother get used to me? He refused, to his dis- he refused till his disciples should return and put up with the hardship. So as we've heard, this Abraham was his disciple. You know, obviously they're very close. Um, and it says he went away. You know, and, but Siusuis, he wouldn't allow anyone else to help him. He didn't want to burden anyone else with himself because he had already, you know, Abraham had already gotten used to him. He knew how to take care of him. He knew, knew what he was expecting uh, to do, all these different things. And he didn't want to place another burden on someone else when he knew that if he can just, you know, wait a few days or whatever, Abraham would be back. You know, it was a, that was a nice, you know, picture of love. So, number one, you know, you're not trying to burden anyone else with unnecessary things. But also, he's letting uh, his disciple, you know, gain his own crowns. You know, he's not taking those crowns away from anyone else. Or allowing anyone else to take those crowns from him. Two more. Saying 51. Abbasisuis, the Theban said to his disciple, Tell me what you see in me, and then I will tell you what I see in you. His disciple said to him, You are a good man, but a little hard. The old man said to him, You are good too, but you are not tough enough. You know, just uh, kind of made me realize how soft we are now, because we wouldn't be able to do hardly uh, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of what these you know, monks and saints did. Then lastly, saying 52. They said of Abbasisuis the Theban that he did not eat bread. At the Paschal feast, the brothers bowed to him and invited him to eat with them. He answered them, there is only one thing I can do. Either I eat bread with you, or else I eat all the dishes you have prepared. They said to him, eat only bread, and he did so. (laughs) So he had this great excuses, you know. He doesn't even eat bread. You know, a lot of times we see in these stories, all they eat is like a little dried bread or something. But he didn't even eat bread. There's another story which I refrained from reading, uh, which... Here, I'll read right now. One day the Saracens came, that is the Muslims. Actually, there weren't Muslims at that time, but the uh, forerunners of the Saracens, or forerunners of the Muslims in that area, Saracens, came and robbed the old man and his brother. As he was setting off into the desert to find something to eat, the old man found some camel dung, and having broken it up, he found some grains of barley in it. He ate the grain and put the other into his hand. His brother came and saw him in the act of eating and said to him, Is this charity to find food and to eat it along without having called me? Abbasiswa said to him, I have not wronged you, brother. Here is your share, which I have kept in my hand. So this is how detached he was from uh, earthly life, that he was okay with picking up some dried uh, camel poop and finding uh, some grains in it. And so this is the man who didn't eat bread. He would you know, eat maybe a few grains or something. So he didn't even want to break that schesis, really, um, for Pascha. He says the Paschal Feast in this saying 52. Um, But he didn't want to uh, disappoint the brothers either. And so he would either do one of two things, either allow himself to eat bread, which he never ate, or he'd have to eat all the dishes they prepared, which would definitely have been something he didn't eat, you know. And uh, he allowed the brothers to choose for him um, so that he wouldn't have to harm his conscience, you know. And the conscience is very important to a person. Some of us have... uh, you know, good consciences. They're alive. Some of us have a uh, you know, little uh, maybe numbed consciences. But the conscience is very important to a person. 
you know, it tells us when we, we, we know when we shouldn't do something, you know, or we know when we should do something because our conscience tells us. Um, you know, there's a great uh, lecture series by Father Josiah Trinum on the conscience, on the Patristic Nectar publications. But, you know, it's a great thing to break your conscience. And if you break your conscience, you should confess it. But he didn't want to, you know, break his own conscience, so he allowed the brothers to decide for him. Either he ate bread, which he doesn't eat, or he eats all the dishes, which he definitely doesn't eat. So they, uh, they picked the uh, lesser of the two. Um, not evils, but in this case, I guess we could say evils. But that's all I have tonight. Are there any questions?